Well, welcome to the Red Star Pilots Association Ground School. My name is Skip Slyfield, call sign ranger, and I want to, right at the outset, thank Mike B. Carter and Gil, the pilot formerly known as Nafod Lapaz, for their really hard work in cutting down what used to be a four-hour death by PowerPoint, lose your will to live extravaganza that would seriously cut into uh, flight training and flight time, which is why you're coming to this upcoming clinic. But in order for this to work, we expect and demand from you guys a couple of things. One of which you need to have the formation manual and have read it and be familiar with it. And of course, you have to sit through this ground school brief. So we're going to do our best to make it quick and relevant. So let's get started. All right, let's talk a little bit about the big picture and the Red Star Pilots Association responsibilities. And this whole ground school is going to be broken into uh, six parts. You're looking at that slide right now. We're not going to go over them right now, obviously. We'll get to those individually. And we'll be stopping and talking sometimes at great length about some things. Others, we're just going to, we're going to push on through. You can read it. And if you have questions, make sure, as I will say several times during this brief, write them down and you're going to bring them to the, uh, to the clinic that you're going to be attending here pretty quickly. But anyway, there's the, there are the, the six parts of the Formation Ground School. Now, the big picture, actually, and the RPA's responsibility is formation and safety training. This is a program that started back in 1993 when the FAA decided that uh, they needed a formalized ground training and vetting procedure for anybody who wanted to fly a warbird or any aircraft for that matter in wavered airspace and in a great success story for the FAA they actually farmed that out if you will to the actual signatory organizations in order for them to come up with their own training programs and their own standards and their own personnel so uh, the FAST program and the responsibilities of the RPA is to develop standards, set policy, create standardized materials, and interface with the FAA and the other signatory organizations. And there's 18 of them, including several overseas. So what we at the RPA have to do, and uh, this is what uh, part of your dues go to, actually, is maintain formation proficiency records, uh, check ride records. We need to track currency, as do you, and issue annual FAST cards, publish training programs, materials, and provide instructors and check pilots to support all members. Now, one thing I want to say is that one of the best resources you've got here is the uh, Red Star website at uh, www.flyredstar.org. You can see that there. And your formation manual. Uh, the Ringman Ground Schools, which you're going through right now, but in order for this program to work, and something I said a little bit earlier in the introduction, is that you guys have got to have downloaded or gotten a paper copy of the formation manual, gone through it thoroughly, and then sit through this brief, what will happen when you get the actual clinic is that we'll have a 45 minute to an hour briefing question and answer uh, situation in which uh, we can go over a lot of this stuff, clear up questions, and then get you airborne as soon as possible. So what are FAST and RPA qualifications? Well, FAST qualifications, actually a wing pilot, lead pilot, and check pilot. Uh, we also have a designated formation instructor program in the RPA, and we're pretty unique in that, and we're working on that to make that uh, a, uh, a really uh, a leading program so we can produce some great IPs for everybody. Uh, what do you need for the uh, wing pilot qualifications? You can take a look at there. Uh, this is what you have to come to the clinic with, all of these qualifications you see there for your wing. So let's just jump right in and get into the basic formation principles. All right, so basic formation principles. Why, in fact, do we fly formation? Well, you know, obviously there's the military reason. That's why actually formation flying began way back in World War I is to get the largest number of aircraft into the combat area as quickly as you possibly can to concentrate force, whether that be bombs on target or air-to-air uh, -air superiority. But why do we do it? We do it for a couple of different reasons. Actually, they're all very good reasons. The most important, I think, personally, is that it gives us a skill set in a demanding environment that makes us better pilots. But also there's the um, exhibition quality of it, if you want to go to an air show, uh, and fly formation. So what 
are some responsibilities that we're looking for in any wing, certainly wing pilot, excuse me, lead pilot, but that's mutual support. We back each other up. We are always alert. We're always trying to help out the other guy in the other aircraft by, you know, monitoring malfunctions, traffic, obstacles. Another thing that we are always, always, always emphasizing, and you should too, is to know your limitations. Know when it's probably this it's a certain situation might uh, be beyond your capabilities or that you're just not comfortable with it. So we're going to be talking a little bit later about knock it off if there are dangerous situations. But what this all kind of boils down to is an attitude and actually a culture of safety and discipline. So again, some more wing pilot responsibilities. You can see here in the slide, uh, you follow and take direction for lead. You maintain the proper position. You work to improve your formation skills at all times and uh, you maintain discipline. And there again, that's that mutual support. So let's talk a little bit about lead pilot responsibilities. So some of you that are here just to learn how to fly a wing, you're wondering, well, why should we talk about lead responsibilities? And I'll tell you why. It's because every flight we do, when we're training to become a good wing, we're also training you to become a good lead. And you'll learn a lot about formation flying by watching your leads. That's what the ultimate goal is. We'll make each one of you guys and gals a leader. So what are lead pilot responsibilities? Let's go through the slide a little bit. Safe conduct of the flight. You set the example. You maintain the situational awareness. Everybody, of course, in the flight does that, but it's lead's overall responsibility for that. Um, he has to have uh, above average knowledge of aircraft systems and the qualifications, techniques, and what's necessary to safely, enjoyably operate a formation flight. So here's some paperwork stuff that, that uh, we emphasize with the leads, and you've got to make sure guys have the credentials, and everybody's in condition to fly, currencies, that kind of thing. And this is going to be also a precursor to what the FAA may want to see before a mass formation in, say, Oshkosh or any kind of wavered airspace. It's also a mark of a good lead that they're checking out um, what someone's qualifications are and where they are in the training. So a good lead always, and this is something too, when you're dash two or dash three, you need to do as well because what are you in fact you're also a lead in your own special way. But you set the power as brief. You generally leave it constant. You'll fly a smooth aircraft. You think for the wingman. You've got to remember that everything you do, even when you're two in the beginning of your training or three, is going to be translated down the line to the other aircraft. You should always think in terms of that in order to, I don't know, dampen the oscillations or just make it a little easier for the guy that's flying on your wing to hang on. Uh, and you strive to maintain SA at all times. Again, once again, that's everybody's responsibility in the flight. So the flight briefing is where this all is set. It's where, the, it's where the tone is set and where the basically usually the flight and how it's going to go is set. And we're going to use briefing checklists. We'll have these provided. You'll find these and you can find them on the website. I very highly recommend that you grab one because this, the last part of your training is going to be going through a very detailed briefing. And uh, that's before we all start flying. And then you brief the flight, you fly the brief. Okay, the flight debrief is probably one of the most important parts of the flight. Well, certainly equal to the, to the, to the brief. But what's something I wanted to say before when we were talking about briefing is that in, in these situations, in, in formation flying, in some of the more uh, advanced stuff that you'll be doing in formation flying in RPA and other organizations, it's a, something I like to, to call the ego bucket. And even experienced guys, I like to bring this up, guys and gals, I like to bring it up and say, when you walk into a briefing room, there's a bucket. And sometimes, if I can remember it, I bring an actual bucket. And I say, I want you to deposit your egos in that bucket. I don't care what you flew, where you flew, how you learned, put the ego in there, and let's all learn and have a great flight, and you can pick your egos up after the debrief. So leave your ego at the door, and critiques of the flight that's going to happen in the debrief is really the what, why, and how. That's what, where you're going to learn. That's where we're going to learn to teach and as leads and check pilots, and eventually when you're standing up there in front of everybody, this is what people are going to want from you. So pilots should feel free to ask questions and give additional information but remember, debrief is not really a democratic process. It's not a big group hug. It's the lead driving 
the process to cover what we just talked about, the what, why, and how of the flight, how it could have gone better, how it went well, and how it's going to go better in the future. At the end of the debrief, there'll be time for questions or very possibly a lead will go through the whole flight. So what did you see? What are your comments and all that? But remember, this is really the lead's debrief to run the way he wants to. One of the things I like to do as a lead is at the very end of the brief, I ask two simple questions. Was the brief clear? And did the flight go as briefed? And that's actually for my learning process as well. Communications. Now, communications are obviously critical in formation, but we're going to be trying to teach you to do as little talking on the radio as you possibly can. Well, how in the world can we do that? With hand signals, with the aircraft, wagging tails or rocking wings. And of course, like I just said, on the radio. So essentially, let's talk a little bit about the use of go versus push. Go, sometimes the Navy would call it switch, is something that is acknowledged both for a check out and a check in. This is very important, and you're probably going to hear this a couple of times. A push, however, is just a switch without acknowledgement. When would you use a push? in a high-density traffic area, towered airport, and again, in that mythical mass formation. Uh, formation communication hand signals. Uh, the, all hand signals are acknowledged with an exaggerated head nod. Lee's going to look back at you make sure you've gotten it. If you don't understand the signal, don't move or shake your head if you can't do it. And then possibly the next thing you'll hear is someone get on the radio, which is what we'll do to solve any kind of ambiguity. Uh, again, brevity. Uh, full call signs, especially in the training environment. Why? Because there's lots of aircraft out there and we want to avoid confusion. We don't want to hear, lead, you're on fire, eject, 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 because, you know, possibly we have five or six different uh, flight leads jumping out. Uh, position number, when responding to simple instructions. And uh, always refer to the flight leader by position number, i.e. Red Star 1, not lead. Formation communications, radio procedures, um, basically all changes that we're going to do are going to be executed from the route position. Uh, you should be moved out by the lead. If not, go ahead and move out yourself. Look down, change your frequencies, and move back into parade. On checks and uh, ops checks and fuel management, the big thing on this slide, take a, look to, take a moment to look at it, is we don't need a novel. If you get a fuel check or an ops check, just check and make sure everything's normal. And all we want is how much fuel you have left, okay? Okay, let's uh, talk about bingo and joker, the who, why, what, and when of, of those calls. Who can call bingo or joker in the flight? And really, that's, that's the call uh, right there on the slide. You know, Raven 4 is joker or bingo. So anybody in the flight can call because fuel management is everyone's responsibility. And we have these tools to actually help lead, keep track of everyone's fuel states in a dynamic maneuvering environment. So bingo, uh, we can talk about first is simply put, it's the call that ends the maneuvering. It ends the flight, essentially, so that lead can get everyone in the flight home with uh, legal reserves or whatever lead might determine is a safe and prudent fuel reserve, taking into account things like uh, conditions uh, of, uh, of the field or weather, traffic congestion, uh, such as that. Joker is a pre-briefed amount of fuel in time that allows lead to make a plan, to wrap up in the maneuvers, you know, finish whatever you guys are doing, terminate and head home before bingo. And why do we do it in time, i.e. minutes? Because of the dissimilar aircraft we fly, um, liters, gallons, pounds is basically meaningless uh, to lead and it could result in math in public and nobody wants that. Okay, here it is, the basic formation position of parade formation. It's referenced obviously off a of lead aircraft and it's about 30 degrees bearing line angle, three feet of wingtip clearance, two to four feet is what we're shooting for and slightly lower than lead. And you're going to triangulate your position from three in three dimensions using three what we call gouge points. And we're going to look at that here in just a second. And you're going to be putting the canopy bow on the inboard aileron hinge, a horizontal spacing line, as you can see there in the picture. It lines up the edges of the elevator trailing edge, and a vertical stack 
which provides vertical alignment, is basically eyes level on the Nanchang. It's where you can just see the round uh, header fuel tank cover. And on the uh, Yak-52, it's basically the wings are, are split, uh, you, where you can see as much on the top as you can on the bottom, and also you can see the oil cooler. So let's take a look at what it actually looks like. The aileron hinge on the canopy bow, you can just see that round fuel cover. Your eyesight, or your eye, eye line, if you will, is going right down the horizontal stabilizer. Beautiful picture of station keeping. Take a look at it. Perfect. All right, here's a great graphic about bearing line deviations. We're just going to tell you what they are. We're going to tell you how to actually correct for them in, a, in just a little bit. It's pretty simple. If you're forward of the bearing line, you're acute. If you're after the bearing line, you're sucked. And this is going to go for just about everything you do, including pitch out and rejoins and uh, trail, close trail, extend trail, and all that stuff. So commit this to memory. What is the basic composition of our formations? It's the two-ship parade element, and that's the basic building block. You can look and see that for yourself. Four-ship is made up of, obviously, two elements. A lead, a wing, a Number three, who is generally deputy lead, could be a lead qualified or someone who's pretty close to it. And then dash four, who gets to have all the fun in four ship parade. So a convention that we use in FAST throughout the entire signatory organization is that all changes to flight configurations are ex executed from fingertip. So in a configuration other than fingertip, lead's going to get you there before he starts moving around. Okay, so what are basic formation maneuvers? Well, I'm not going to go through each individual one of these things. You can look at it here in the slide. But a good lead, and again, this is technique, but a good lead is going to basically write this stuff down on the board, and this is what a typical RPA training formation flight is going to consist of. So you being the eager wing that you are, probably would be smart to write that down on your knee board so that you can look down and see what comes next and it won't be a mystery. Station keeping. How do we get it and how do we keep it? An IP is going to take you out to the flight line before you fly. It's going to position you where you basically would be and you can look at those sight lines before you actually go flying. But the key is to make constant small corrections. Got to relax the death grip. Don't try to squeeze the black juice out of the stick. Remember, you're having fun. Relax. But you need to make expeditious but small corrections, and here's the key. you got to let them take effect before you recorrect. So generally, correct your position in this logical sequence, A, B, C. Let's go through these together. You correct altitude first, vertical stack. How do you do that? Well, pitch generally, right? But what happens when you change your pitch? You're going to change your airspeed. You might very well have to change power as well. Then you got to correct your bearing line. If you're acute, you've got to move back to the bearing line. If you're sucked, you've got to move forward. Now, that's not just a power correction. That can also be angle bank. Your IP is going to show you all this stuff. It seems really complicated. You know, it is. But it's going to become second nature. And you correct closeness, lateral spacing. Okay, well, let's talk about station keeping and turns away and turns into in what we call welded wing, which means you stay in, in the same position that you just looked at, but you have to do different things to maintain that, especially if you're turning away from the wingman. Now, this is something you need to anticipate and get these corrections in really as it happens, maybe even a little bit more. That's the uh, well, what we mean by anticipation, right? So in fingertip situation, turns away the radius of turn circle and the altitude is increasing so it's actually moving away from you. What do you have to do? You have to add power and you have to use pitch to climb maintaining that position that we just looked at. Conversely in the next slide turns towards you means that you have to decrease power and then descend again using pitch to do this right and then guess what remember You've got to uh, recorrect and adjust your power and po very possibly your pitch to stay in position. Sounds like really fun stuff, right? So just, hey, come on, relax. Okay, let's take a look at another outstanding video about station keeping as two. Simple, right? 
turn into. I have to decrease some power because you are on the inside of the turn and making sl slight pitch corrections. A little bit of angle bank to stay on the bearing line. Beautifully done. Very nicely done. All right, recognition. Continuously and quickly correct. Anticipate, anticipate, anticipate. Be ahead of the airplane and use trim. And oh yeah, relax. Remember, you're having fun, right? All right, let's talk about taxi. Again, these, this can change, so we're not gonna go through every possible iteration of taxiing, but uh, spacing generally is in trail, two to four ship lengths, um, and staggered, certainly two ship lengths. What is that? About a taxi light or so, if you have taxi lights. Anticipate that tail draggers will be doing S-turns to be able to see, so you're gonna have to give them a little bit more space. All right, let's talk about run-up options. There are, there are several, but uh, basically, the basics are you're going to do a formation run-up or an individual run-up. In a formation run-up, you're going to be in, obviously, formation, staggered, in the run-up area, and certain things are going to have to happen. An individual run-up, you'll see not so often when you're doing training, but it's possible, and that's basically, it's where you're responsible for doing your own run-up and making sure your aircraft and you are ready to fly, and then giving your lead a thumbs-up, one single thumbs-up, that you're ready to fly. Formation run up. Let's go through it real quickly. So, dash four is going to, when he's ready for run up, give you a thumbs up. You're going to pass along the line. The lead's going to give you the run up signal. You're going to do your run ups, make sure your airplane's ready to go. You're going to look back to your right, and when the guy to your right or the gal to your right is ready to go or left, depending on how you're lined up, you're going to pass that thumbs up, and that is the signal that you're ready for takeoff. Here's a little note for you guys check each aircraft out as you give the thumbs up so you can catch anything that might be a possible safety of flight deal for your wingman or for your lead okay it's what we talk about when we're talking about mutual support here are your lineup options we're not going to go through these very uh too too much here today because each one of these could be different and your lead will brief these interval takeoffs um there are two types of interval takeoffs we do. One's for narrow runway operations. You can see this on the slide. And one if the runway is 100 feet or greater, which gives your lead a little more leeway, if you will, to decide how they want to get the flight going. But essentially, our definition of narrow runway is 60 to 75 feet wide. And you will do individual takeoffs using liftoff interval of daylight under the mains. Now, if a runway is 100 feet or greater, you can line up and split elements. Uh, you can offset the elements or echelon. Depends on what your lead wants to do. And individual takeoffs can be used using timed intervals for nose wheel aircraft only. It can be daylight under the mains or it can be timed no less than six seconds. But in this situation, you maintain your side of the center line at all times. So element takeoff. Okay, now we're getting to uh, the fun, but also the very precise stuff. Element takeoff, two aircraft taking off together in the Navy, we call it a section go. Runway width has got to be 100 feet or greater to give you 10 feet of wingtip clearance, and you've got to keep your crosswinds five knots or less. The power setting speeds will be established in briefing. It's very important, especially if you're flying with dissimilar aircraft like a 285 horsepower Chang, 360 horsepower Chang. Okay, running position. Wingman into the wind, and if it's no wind, it's desired for some position, turn out traffic, and your lead will decide. But re realize this, that your lead takes the side and chooses, and you take the opposite one, of course. So wing, you're actually in an acute position. You're just behind the 3-9 line. You line up lead's main gear lines. So let's go through this element takeoff point by point so you know how this is going to go. Wing pilot looks at lead, when in position on runway, and nods head for the ready signal. Now, make sure you check lead's nose wheels. He's going to check yours because that could ruin your whole day if it's cocked into you and his first movement is into your nose. Call it out. Use the radio. Lead's going to point skyward and rotate the finger and you're going to nod your head in acknowledgement. There's going to be a lot of head nodding going on here. And lead and wing will run up engines to a brief setting, obviously, that you can hold your brakes. Take a quick check of your instrument and when you're ready for go to go, you nod your head, the lead gives an exaggerated head down nod, and you release the brake when lead's chin hits the chest. Lead is going to set a brief takeoff power slowly and smoothly, and you're going to try to match it. Try to match lead's rate of acceleration. Don't jam in the power. 
And if you find yourself beginning to drift back, you give them a call. Then right there it is, Raven 1, give me one, or Raven 1, push it up. If you're starting to get ahead of lead, you can also tap your brake a little bit, but try not to pull the power because if you get behind lead, you'll never catch up. However, let's talk about the opposite of that. Breaking the 3-9 line, if you start to pull in front of lead, you then will become a lead candidate because you will hear next, you have the lead on the left or the right. The wingman goes to full power, fly the brief departure, and lead will regain formation integrity. One able, on departure, and everybody's airborne. So if you're going sucked, kind of jumping back a little bit, fly your airplane. Give a, a gimme call. Uh, ensure you're at max power. Then you, if you think that the aircraft isn't accelerating correctly, check your instruments and aboard if you need to. Maintain your side of the runway at all times. All right, so you match lead's rotation right, rate. You see his nose start to, to uh, decompress and start come off. Go ahead and match that. Don't over-rotate. Don't stay on the ground too long. After you're safely airborne, lead is going to initiate the rear gear retraction with a thumbs up followed by an exaggerated head nod for execution. Maintain the formation takeoff position until gear retraction. Lead's going to adjust his climb power and then you move into parade position. All right, let's go back a little bit to interval takeoff. How do we get the formation back together again? Well, we've got oh, a couple of different tools in our kit. Well, there's a straight ahead or a turning re uh, rejoin. But what you need to know is that dash two is always going to join on the inside of the turn. Three and four is always going to join opposite of two. A straight ahead is going to be into a standard fingertip and strong right or strong left. That'll be pretty much either obvious or briefed. All right, tell you what, let's take a break. break. You get a beer, bring one for me, and we'll pick this up again and start talking about some real fun stuff. Let's talk about some different formations. Let's talk about route formation real quick. It's uh, just a two to four ship widths minimum, uh, out to 500 feet from a beam lead, and no further aft than the bearing line. You basically camp out fairly close to the 3-9 line because we're going to be using this formation for a series of different things, for checklists, for ops checks, for traffic lookout, specifically for when you're going cross-country and you don't want to have to fly close parade the whole time. Um, but what's important is that you don't get so far back that lead can't see you or can't pass hand signals because you might have to uh, communicate in a high radio density traffic area like the L.A. Basin. If you're so far back out towards Louisiana that you can't see it, he's going to have to rock you aboard. You're going to have to expend time and gas to get there. So take a look at those slides and you get a good picture of what route formation is is. Another thing to think about in route, just to make it easier for you, and also to, so you'll have, you won't burn too much fuel, is that when you're doing route formation turns away, the uh, dash two basically maintains its position, about 30 degrees angle bank max what we use, but three and four can use echelon turns to both relieve workload and fuel burn. What's echelon? Oh, I'm glad you asked. There it is. And there's another really nice looking echelon formation. And we're going to talk about why, why we use it. And, but if you look at this slide, you'll notice that the heads are pretty much aligned and the aircraft are turning all along their axis. All aircraft is on the same side of the lead and it's used for pitch outs, traffic pattern, and air show display because it looks cool. But here's the key. All aircraft pivot on a longitudinal axis, which means you roll about your own axis, and you also have to climb to put the fuselage of flight leader's aircraft uh, ahead and split the horizon. About up 45 degrees angle bank or more. Let's look at this echelon video, and you'll get to see a, a, the big picture. There it is. Again, the helmets are pretty much lined up. They start their turn as dash four. Guess what you're going to have to do? Add power. You bet. Turn about your access, line the aircraft up, but remember, you're always flying off lead, keeping three and four, of course, in sight. All right, the cross under. This is how we basically set up for maneuvers. We change the formations. It's um, a very deliberate maneuver, and uh, there it is. You set up for pitch out, and give wingman out of the sun. Uh, or change across countries, or basically for lead amusement if he's getting bored out there. There's the signal, our own Duke Moulter. 
real quick note about signals. Make sure you give them crisply and high enough in the canopy or away from the canopy bow so they can be seen, especially by dash three and four, even though and uh, you know it might not be for them, at least they know what's going on. So it's a three-part wings level maneuver. You reduce power, you move down using pitch, you add a small amount of power to stabilize, you use a little slight bank and rudder to the opposite side, it's just a, basically a wing rock, and you begin your crossing rate. Don't increase your crossing rate, keep it the same, and you maintain your nose to tail clearance. And when you're approaching the bearing line on the other side, and remember you're just beginning bearing line just a little bit low, you take that heading differential out simply by rocking your wings, Stabilize, power up, move into position. Simple, simple stuff. Let's take a look at the video. A really nice shot. So, again, a very precise movement, and it should be describing essentially a U. But take time to stabilize in each position so you can minimize the variables and move up into position. Acquiring the bearing line, step down, and proper wingtip clearance. Close trail. And of course, we always have smoke when we're practicing this. No, actually, we don't. But anyway, here's a good picture of close trail. Basically, the wing aircraft are welded to lead. Everybody's going to move as one aircraft. And you use power in this exercise to main position. Uh, minor lead and lag may be called for, and we'll go up to 45 degrees angle of bank. So why do we use this close trail? Well, partly it's training for being four in a diamond. It's also just good practice. Think of the other aircraft or the aircraft in front of you as being essentially a horizontal gyro. You are matching the wing and the wing uh, rate and roll rate. So we had to get to close trail. There's our signal. And reform from close trail, really actually almost any formation is a wing rock or a radio call if necessary and reform to your last position, left or right. Here's the reference. Your wingtip is superimposed on the canopy bow with wingtips touching. This is a Nanshang for, uh, for a yak. It's superimposed on the top horizontal canopy cross base. Diamond formation. So diamond is basically putting dash four into the slot. The execution signal is four fingers held up, fist held up with thumb extended, monitoring to rear. Three acknowledges lead and signals four. That's basically the, about the only signal that three needs to repeat. Four calls when in position, Raven four is in, and when it's time to rejoin, lead will make a radio call or rock his wings and four will rejoin in the original position. Two and three are flying standard parade position and four is flying that close trail that we just practiced. Now, there's a common error that four tends to be too far aft and a way to correct that is to move up into that trail position but also fly your normal parade bearing line on two and three and that'll take care of being too far aft and you will in fact be balancing the formation making it look like a nice diamond. So pitch it out. Now pitch out is part of the process of rejoining uh, or to get to extended trail or for the 360 degree overhead pattern recovery uh, training and it's executed from echelon which will lead will get you into that and typically it's 180 degrees to G level turn. What are the signals? Here they are right uh, here. Lead points skyward and rotates the finger. And uh, lead holds up numbers of finger to indicate the break intervals. Two acknowledges, big head nod. And the key here is that everybody counts. That's the interval you actually use. And that's how you're going to make your pitch out and your rejoin and your, your recovery pitch out look good. Um, lead turns away in level turn. Uh, aircraft, each aircraft breaks at the proper interval and call in when level, directly behind the preceding aircraft. And this is a good time. Take a breath, relax, check your aircraft, check your fuel, make sure everything's working correctly. Here's a good pitch out video. Let's take a look at this. Potato, two potato, three potato, four. One potato, two potato, three potato, four. One potato, two potato, three potato, four. Very nice. All right, extended trail. It's a training exercise. It's also a lot of fun. And it, you're going to learn one of the basics of pursuit, both lead and lag, which is going to come in handy in a few moments as we talk about rejoins. And also, it's a building block for much more advanced formation maneuvers. Essentially, 
uh, you're going to be maintaining your position or your nose to tail separation actually more, more uh, accurately by using lead and lag pursuit and you're going to be maneuvering an offset cone and you're not matching two spacing. Here are the zones you want to stay in and avoid. The blue circles essentially is what you're going to be using for this pursuit curve that we're going to show you here in a moment. But the yellow is what you want to stay out of. In any event, you don't want to camp out. You want to use the dynamics of plane of motion. And here is really a great picture of lag, pure, and lead. It's all about nose position. And as you notice the way this slide is drawn, you can lag or lead the nose of an aircraft that you're trying to close on. Clearly you lead if you want to close, get closer, or you lag if you want to uh, extend your nose to tail. It works in any plane of motion, and by that I mean going up, going down, going left, going right. So lead, lag, and pure pursuit. It can be used anywhere in a turn circle geometry. Turning rejoins. Now there are four variables. We've broken them down because the whole key to good formation flying is to reduce the variables. One, bearing line. Two is altitude. Three is airspeed. By number four, alignment, we mean fuselage alignment. Two fuselages aligned is going to make it much easier to affect your rejoin. First thing you do is add power. You increase your airspeed so you can expedite your rejoin. And you're going to, of course, in the process, determine if it's a straight ahead or a turning rejoin. If it's a turning rejoin, you determine if you're inside or outside the turn circle. What does that mean? If you're inside, obviously, let's just say it's a left turn, you're going to be looking for the lead on your right, somewhere in your right canopy. If it's your outside, he'd be on the left or in front, and you would be in pure or lag pursuit. If it's inside the turn circle, you pull lead pursuit to capture the bear line. What that means, how do you do that? You increase your angle bank a little bit and fly to the bearing line, anticipating just before you get there that you're going to have to take some angle bank out and reestablish a nice 30 degree angle bank, basically. If you're outside the turn circle, you've got to fly directly ahead toward a point in space where the lead started his rejoin turn and then start your turn and then acquire the bearing line. Let's watch this rejoin video and I think it'll be a little more clear when you see this. So there's obviously lead two and three already rejoined. It's keeping lead basically on or slightly above the horizon. He's taking care of his altitude. And now what we're looking for is a really nice indication off of lead now. He's flying off of lead where the tail is right on the tip of the wing, the left wing. And he's getting just a little tiny bit, what, acute there. But now, about three wingspans, he begins his play. Take a little bit of step down, add power, power, power come back up now into the turn away position and back into position. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about recognizing, managing the bearing line in relation to what we just saw on that slide. So slide number one, obviously you're sucked. Looked at the position of the tail. It's moved down a little bit and slightly in, in front of the up wing tip. On bearing line, perfect. Look at that, the tail is on the, um, the top of the wing. And acute means you're in front of the bearing line and your aspect is increasing. Well, how do you fix it? Well, number one, you're a little bit sucked. So fix your bearing line using angle bank. Increase your angle bank slightly out to the bearing line. And then adjust your power and your angle bank because remember, there's three corrections to everything you do. If you're on the bearing line, excellent. Check your airspeed because airspeed controls closure. Watch your airspeed until you actually start to see closure, then you don't have to watch your airspeed anymore. If you're acute, it means you're flying out in front of the bearing line or your aspect is increasing, so how do you fix that? Take some angle bank out, let the bearing line essentially come to you. Actually, it's probably better to think that you're flying back to the bearing line. Increase your angle bank, align your fuselages, Check your airspeed so that you don't stagnate and resume your rejoin. So remember, it's ABC. Fix your altitude, pitch and sight picture, bearing line, which is controlled by angle of bank, and closure. 
which is power or airspeed. So here's a rejoined bearing line. Once again, you can see flying off of lead that that's a great bearing line picture. Do note the, f the fuselage, however. It's slightly angled, so about here, the pilot flying the rejoin is going to need to use some rudder to align the fuselages. What does that do? It makes all of these angles, all these sight pictures and everything we're talking about work out. It's reducing those variables. So managing a rejoin. If you're buying behind the bearing line, you're stuck. Increase bank. Ahead of the bearing line, decrease angle of bank. Fine-tune your rejoin with power. And again, usually th within three to four wingspans from moving into the prey position, you start your step down if you were joining to the outside of the race at turn. Okay, overshoots. And this is very critical. You're definitely going to see this on your check rides, and you're going to have to be able to demonstrate recognition and how you fix an overshoot. How does an overshoot occur? You're carrying too much closure. You're too acute. It could be any number of things. You might be mismatched. Maybe your lead has not maintained his airspeed. It could be a, a number of things. But what's critical is that you recognize it and you correct, and you do what we call an underrun. So let's talk about it real quickly. Essentially, if you realize you're overshooting, you've got to level your wings, pull power if you need to, so you can pass below and behind the lead. Then you have to overbank, adjust power, stabilize, make sure there's space for you, and go back inside the race of turn to establish bearing line. Don't lose sight, and you can reform back to position once you're sure there's space for you. All right, straight ahead rejoins. Why do we use straight ahead rejoins? Well, sometimes it's we're called for in departure, and, and you have to be aware of the fact that sometimes a turning rejoin can turn into a straight ahead rejoin and then turn back into a turning rejoin. So you got to stay flexible and know how to do both. So really, essentially for straight ahead rejoin, we'll go through this here, step one. You add power up to max to achieve at least 10 knots of advantage or 10%. You offset about two ships ship widths, and your instructors show you this, and then you acquire the bearing line by flying up to it, either left or right, and then using angle bank, go ahead and fly down the bearing line. Now this could be in a climb, this could be level, so you're gonna have to manage your power and your airspeed. So let's take a break, get another beer, especially a cold one for me, smooch your loved one, and go ahead and wash your cat. That'll make you appreciate this brief a lot more when you come back. Formation recovery. Now, how do we get back to home plate? There are several recovery options. Obviously, the 360-degree pattern, uh, 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 entering a, a VFR pattern, det being detached. That's not very common. Uh, you'll go through some of those with your instructors. And then the two-ship element formation landings. Now, a smart wing and or lead can would uh, pay really attention, close attention to that because you're probably going to see that in a check ride. But at any rate, all maneuvering turns in the traffic pattern are echelon turns. What's the traffic pattern? Wherever you think the traffic pattern begins, essentially maneuvering for the brake. There's a good picture of what the brake looks like. Lead is going to configure the flight. He's going to give the signal, which is the same as the rejoin, and the fingers for the number of seconds he wants. Uh, standards five seconds, and that creates a 10-second interval on downwind, which is important, as you will see here in a moment. The brake from echelon. Lead is going to pitch level over the numbers and he's going to reduce power when his wings are level on the downwind to slow. Standard is 90 knots, or is briefed if you have dissimilar aircraft, and we're using max 45 degrees maximum bank. If you have overshooting crosswinds or undershooting crosswinds, lead is going to adjust for that. You need to also. Uh, wing pilots pitch level at interval. Whatever that is, whatever it's brief or whatever it turns out to be, you reduce your power when your wings are level on downwind and you slow to 90 knots and each wingman lines up behind the preceding aircraft. Lead extends the gear on downwind and the flaps approaching the perch. Wing pilots extend gear on downwind and flaps approaching the perch. So if this sounds uniform and standardized, it's because it is. It also makes that 10 second interval a reality. It turned the base the same place as Lee did. Center line landing is on narrow runways, but it's a narrow runway you can anticipate Lee landing on a center line, and each wing pot's going to do the same, and you're going to have to have that expanded interval be, and to maintain it at touchdown. And you have no clear lane. You might want, or Lee might want, to expand that interval for the break. 
and all aircraft are going to taxi the brief runway exit, and lead will assemble the flight. All right, staggered landing procedure. Let's talk about this a little bit because it's a little bit complicated. So if lead is landing on the cold side, which means that the runway is wide enough to provide essentially clear lanes for every aircraft la landing, each wing pilot will land on alternating sides of the runway, two, three, and four. And that's, of course, using the 1,500-foot minimum spacing at threshold, which is that 10-second interval we talked about, and we'd like to have 2,000 feet. But pilots, once you're slowed and you're under control and you can clear the preceding aircraft into the cold side by saying two is slow. Don't use the word clear because that is a little bit confusing. Just say that you're under control and that would clear, if you'll follow me, the other aircraft to cross into that, leaving the other uh, clear way for an aircraft that might have brake fade or have to go around. Uh, and again, if you have a problem, brake fade, call it out, and what you're going to do, not what you want someone else to do, what you're going to do. So all aircraft will exit, a brief runway exit, and then the lead will be responsible for assembling the flight at the end. All right, let's talk about the two-ship element landing, or the formation landing, if you will. It's recommended, obviously, training requires. You're all going to do it. You're going to do it until you're proficient at it. And you need, in the training environment, again, the 100-foot runway minimum, crosswind of five knots or less, no gust factor. Sounds familiar. And you need, generally, to coordinate a straight in for landing or at least a very large box pattern. Let's talk a little bit about how the signals are going to go. You're going to lead is going to slow your flight and going to signal for the gear first. Obviously, there you go. Good picture of Duke with the thumb extended, fist, fist gesturing down, sorry. And you execute after the preparatory command when the chin hits the chest. So leads make it a big uh, head nod. So you don't leave, leave your wings guessing. Again, flaps, you all know that because you've studied it. Final approach, here's what's going to happen. Lead is going to line to the downwind side of the runway, and the wingman is going to move to that acute position. You're going to line up the main gear legs. It's going to look a lot like what? The element takeoff. You're going to stack level. You're going to bisect the horizon if you have one with the Leeds aircraft and start down the glide slope. All right, short final, a lot happens here, and your lead really needs to be on top of this as well as you do. So lead's going to maintain extra airspeed, typically at least 80 knots, and certainly no slower, and you don't want anything steeper than a three-degree glide slope, which is pretty typical anyway. Wingman, you maintain precise formation landing position throughout the touchdown, and lead, the contract is for you guys to keep your power up so that wing has something to work with. And wingmen do not hesitate to call for power. You know, Raven lead, push it up if you find yourself at idle. There's nothing more uncomfortable than hanging back on the blades with no place to go. So you flare with the lead, and the wingman touches down with or just slightly before lead, which is much preferable to touching down after lead unless you want to take over lead duties Again, wingman, brake lightly, obtain nose-to-tail separation on lead, and then clear the runway where briefed. Once again, the lead's going to assemble the flight, clear of the runway, with all wingmen pass the hold short line, flops will be retracted, either on signal or as briefed, and then your flight will taxi back as briefed and staggered. All right, chaps, almost there. Let's talk about contingency procedures. We're going to go through the rules of collision avoidance, and we're going to go through each individual one of them. Always keep lead in sight. Always maintain separation. Always closely monitor closure, which means don't go head down in the cockpit. Always consider wake turbulence and how to avoid it. Never move ahead of your lead aircraft. Never go belly up to your lead aircraft or the aircraft in front of you. And if you lose sight, you've got to call blind immediately and possibly start taking immediate actions. Let's talk a little bit about the two safety calls. There's a knock it off and there's a terminate. A knock it off is a safety call. Anybody in a flight can call it for any number of things. Um, safety issue developing, immediate hazards to flight, uh, you're uncomfortable, multiple loss sites. If people just basically are going tumbleweed, anybody can call it. 
and it is a knock it off. And then the entire flight ripples it down the line. It'll be Red Star 1, knock it off. Red Star 2, knock it off. Red Star 3, knock it off. All down the line. This can be, once again, anybody's call. Terminate is usually the lead or the person who's responsible for training to stop whatever training maneuver because the objectives have been met or there just isn't any point in it anymore. And so it's terminate. And again, everybody not, uh, in the formation acknowledges this. So knock it off and terminate. Blind, going back to that call again, very critically important. Give the blind call, give your altitude, and basically what you're doing. And if lead is the visual, he's gonna talk you back into the formation. And if both aircraft are blind, you can probably pretty much immediately anticipate a knock it off and you're gonna get 500 feet of altitude separation, basically find blue sky and pull for it, take a breath and get the formation back together. What are the reasons for breakout? A breakout, again, is a call and a maneuver. If you lose sight and you don't get directed immediately, that's a breakout. If there's a hazard to the flight, hopefully it's not you, that's a reason for a breakout, or if you're directed by lead. Again, look for blue sky and pull with caution and give a radio call. Let everybody know what you are doing. Raven 2, breaking out, heading north, blind, 3500. And that's lead's responsibility to restore the flight. Now, there are all sorts of reasons that you might be a chase airplane. There might, there might be damaged aircraft. There might be emergency aircraft. I'm not going to go through each one of these things, but please familiarize yourself with the following slides so that we can get a lot out of what will be a sort of a generic SAR brief when we uh, do our get-together at the clinic. And air some chase pilot responsibilities when leading and chase responsibilities when on the wing. Lots of moving parts, like I said earlier, and they can all change with, uh, with the circumstances, so we won't go through each one of these things. So search and re rescue procedures, another bunch of really good information. You need to be aware of this and think about the things you need to do. Every situation is going to be different. But one of the things I like to brief in any situation is set a bingo. Because one aircraft on the ground is very bad, two airplanes on the ground because one runs out of fuel is extremely bad. Emergencies can either ha can also happen immediately after takeoff. You have engine failures, force landings, emergency returns, and again, chase ship requirements are going to be different than you're out in the area. You're going to start getting used to this. You're going to see some scenarios. You're going to be uh, talking about scenarios. Emergencies uh, can be flight leave aboards, wingman aboards, element aboards, in the air, in the uh, practice area, and of course, Nordos. Let's talk a little bit about Nordo. It, of course, means no radio, and the Nordo typically is going to be led back to the field or the alternate. And training usually is not going to continue, but if the element landing is qualified, you'll land as formation if able. The easiest way, though, is to basically bring the flight back with Nordo aircraft as number two, you can possibly anticipate that, with the lead or whoever's leading the flight telling the tower or the uh, CTAF area what's gonna happen. And then the Nordo aircraft will do whatever their lead does. They'll either land or go around if necessary and return to the pattern, but they'll follow the, um, the lead aircraft. And that'll, that'll be briefed in uh, each, it should be briefed in each and every flight. So let's go to the last bit here about the HIFO signals. Now, guys, this is if your radio doesn't work. If your radio works and you have an electrical problem, talk about it, all right? But if you don't have a radio and you have other problems, get your lead's attention, walk your wings if you need to, get his attention, his or her attention, and then use the HIFO signals, which is a weeping motion fist on the top of the helmet and there it is. One is hydraulics, but it's pneumatics for most of the uh, Warsaw-packed aircraft. Two is electrical, three is fuel, four is oxygen, which typically none of us have, and five, of course, is the big one, engine. Use them if your radio doesn't work. So that concludes this relatively quick and dirty ground school formation lesson. I hope you've taken plenty of notes and that you have questions, that you'll bring them to the 
clinic and we'll go over them. Uh, remember, your formation manual is the best source for answering your questions, uh, but you can reach out to your regional directors uh, or check pilots in your area. We'd be happy to, to, to answer any questions you have and go over some techniques and procedures. Uh, but we'll really look forward to seeing you and flying with you and having fun. And thanks for your attention. Where's my beer? <laughs>